Coburn Bible, Book 5, Book of Manuscripts, Chapter 33, Annexed Scroll 1. MAN 33-1 O oh, great city, O oh, heart of Egypt, your habitations are overthrown, and your sacred shrines lie buried beneath the sands of time. The dust of ages enwraps you as a dead one is swathed within the tomb. Your temples still stand and ring with noise, but the solemn shrines are silent. They have become an abode for the wild dog and scorpion, and your roads are highways of wickedness. MAN 33-2 Behold, in the days long gone, down into dust, the whirlwind came and earth poured out her wrathful breath, so that you were burnt. The evildoers were swept away by the waters, and the wicked ones were swallowed up in the fires. The days of the years were shortened, and the times of all things altered. The seasons were turned around so that the seed rotted within the soil, and no green shoots came forth to greet the day. All buds withered upon the vines. The land lay dead under its gray shroud. The moon changed the order of her ways, and the sun set himself a new course, so that men knew not where they were, and all were afflicted. The stars swam in a new direction, and the whole order of things was changed. Yet, O oh Egypt, even from those days of calamity you emerged unbroken, your spirit intact, your heart unshaken. What has happened to you, O oh land of mine? MAN 33-3 Weep, O land of Egypt, weep for the things that have gone, weep for the spirit now departed, weep for the betrayed gods, weep for the great gods so high above them that you scarcely knew them, weep for the destruction that has befallen you, weep for all the beauty and glory that have gone down into the dust, weep for eternal ages and sleep forevermore. Your spirit has departed, your life had ebbed away, your vitality has burned itself out. Only the empty corpse remains. The generations yet to tread the earth will know nothing of you. They will see no more than the dead, dried, mummified thing. The loving life that once vitalized it so gloriously. They cannot know. O oh, son of Kabu, forgive the people of this land for their ways. Reveal your greatness by serving those who no longer walk in the light of your instruction. Even as you serve their fathers, in days gone by. MAN 334 My land, what have you become? You have left the true path of your faith and wandered into strange byways. You are bemused and bedazzled with things that disturb the senses, and have become like a ship adrift without oars. You have abandoned the spirit that inspired you and sought satisfaction among lifeless things of earth. You have spurned the stern discipline required to win the hand of love and trodden the well-worn path of carnal satisfaction. You have turned to the ways of the harlot, and out of your harlotry you have wrought destruction. You no longer delight in the serene mystery of the stars above. Your pleasures are in the filth beneath your feet, where once you gazed upward and are. Now you look downward in degradation. Oh, that this is the self-chosen fate of my land. MAN 33-5 I go, for go I must. I depart for destiny. Demands it. When his motherland collapses about him, like an undermined palace, built on a foundation of mud, then it is not a time for hesitation. One man cannot stem a flood with his hand. When his habitation falls apart, it is time to seek another. Perhaps nations, like men, grow old and decay. My land is old. A hundred and twenty generations have passed through. Since the Syrah brought light to men, four times the stars have moved to new positions, and twice the sun has changed the direction of his journey. Twice the destroyer has struck earth, and Three times the heavens have opened and shut. Twice the land has been swept clean by water. MAN 33-6 The lot of a man destined for exile is sorrow. What is a sorrowful man? I would save others from my misery. 
I would leave a memorial for their guidance and knowledge to increase the wisdom of their days. Let my voice of warning ring out to all men. Let it reach even the strange lands beyond the seas, even unto Hunnabit. Listen to my voice. Take heed to my cry. Be warned, lest you too fall under the condemnation of destiny, lest you too be struck down by the sword of tribulation. My motherland, the land I knew, is no more. It lives, yes, as a flower lives when plucked and dried, as a fruit lives when pickled and preserved, or as a man lives when embalmed. M.A.N. 337 About the days of none, we have no knowledge before creation commenced. There was the one, father, mother, being, and from this divinity came the heavenly twins. From these were born three, and the three became many. Thus, even in the beginning, it was divinely ordained that brother and sister might be wed. From the first heavenly twins were born those whose destiny it was to be eternally married. For theirs was the divine right of eternal and undying love, a love unknown to mortals, but to which if they would be more than mortal, they must aspire. This love is the light of life, the light of the earth, the sun of the spirit. M.A.N. 33.8 The originating divinity is called many names among men, and in Egypt his names are hidden in other names. Among the chosen ones, he is called the craftsman, creator. But men and women name him differently among the people. Likewise, some say him, while others say her. It is all alike, for these are no more than the words and distinctions of mortal man. Heaven is the sphere of God, the true abode of his spirit in essence. There is the heaven above, which is the high heaven, and the heaven below, which is the reflection of the high heaven. The true center of God is in Noet. M.A.N. 33 9. The craftsman of creation placed heaven and earth apart. He set the sun and stars in motion and spread wide the earth beneath them. His wisdom he enclosed within the hearts of men, wherein it still lies sleeping. Heaven goes his daily rounds like a husband, forging for his wife's sustenance. While earth is busy with the duties of a wife, feeding and cherishing that which she has brought forth. Is not all life known to man, born of earth? Is it not nourished upon her breast? Unless it be that they derive pleasure in company, why do heaven and earth remain together? Without earth, how could the grass grow, the basic substance of life? How could trees, fruit, and flowers bloom? Without earth, what could the water and warmth of heaven produce? M.A.N. 3310 God put desire for each other into the hearts of men and women, that in their union the race of men should be preserved. Likewise, he has implanted in every part of life the desire for another compatible part. Thus life endures and multiplies. Earth and all life upon it are bent towards one end, one purpose, the service and development of man. Without man as the objective, earth would be useless. It would have a purposeless, futile existence. Even night and day, the daylight and dark serve in the nurture and development of man. M.A.N. 3311 In the early days, Egypt was bounded in the west by the green, bitter waters. There lay the land of Nalar where men learned to bend the dead bodies so that the earth-bound spirits of departed ones should not wander to molest them. Out here was the city of Moro, from whence came the mighty men who smote the giants in the days of yore. Northward lay the entrance to the kingdom of darkness under the earth. The portal lies behind a veil of air mixed with water. It is covered with a mantle of cloudy thickness which eyes can scarce see through. The floor is of water, not too deep that the dismal stony bottom cannot be seen. Hence, men require a boat. Both sides of the entrance are flanked with giant blocks of stone, from which rise huge pillars, set one against the other, so that there is no space between them. The hole is overset with 
an immense rock greater than any cut by mortal hands, and it is shaped like the rump of a man. It is in a cold region of long darkness, where the calf of gold shows his displeasure. Now to the west of Egypt, all is barren and sandy, except to the north, which is the habitation of wild men who dwell in holes within the ground. MAN 3312 Out of the land of God, to the east came Asira, who was one filled with the Spirit of God, the first vice region of God on earth, truly a God who walked among men, a true Son of God. He learned by communicating with the heart of God what lesser beings can hope to learn only by long contemplation of the sacred writings. Yet, he said, not all can hope to see. It is not a thing granted to men. But even he who only hears and has faith in his heart, who stretches himself out to do good, who conforms with the teachings, who is one with us, he also shall attain to the glory of an awakened spirit. He, too, shall share the joyful heritage of a righteous man. I, who have journeyed the full distance to the fount of fire, lit a torch there and turned back to meet you with the comforting light of its flame. Hence, there is no need for you to journey the full length of the long, weary road to see the truth. MAN 3313 In the book of the Bearers of Light is written, God speaks with Asira. Have you measured my words in silent communion with mine own self? Has the darkness of earth's delusions been dispelled by your own inner light? Asira says, By the grace of the communication granted me, I have seen the light of truth, and all the delusions of darkness have gone. My doubts are now no more. My faith is confirmed. It is firm. I am the steadfast one. I say in truth, your will be done. Osiris speaks to men. I heard these words of glory spoken within the silence and solitude of the great cavern. And they filled my soul with awe and wonder. By the working of a wondrous thing, I heard these words in the sacred silence. I knew the mystery of life. I will ever remember the things burnt into my soul. I came out. When I spoke with men, my tongue danced with exultation. These things are written. MAN 3314 Later, Osiris went up into the sacred high place and there learned the ordinances for the well-being of man. He was given the rules for safeguarding the sacred mysteries, and he was also shown the workings of the great law. When he came down, he chose the best of those about him and appointed the Council of Light, which numbered 24. MAN 3315 These are the words he spoke to them by the Sea of Death. These are things to be explained to none but those with understanding and enlightenment. The path of the true way will be long and arduous, its trials and tribulations manifold and harsh. It is not a place for the faint-hearted, and the oily-tongued, or double-tongued, will not be found there. Yet it will never lack a pilgrim, for there will always be seekers of truth and fighters for goodness. Nevertheless, treat this not as a light thing, weigh these words well, and do not belittle the perils of the road ahead. Take good heed of my warnings. MAN 3316 The path of the true way is one beset with the sharp stones of suffering and sorrow. The mortal flesh shall be torn by the sharp thorns of pain and tribulation. Thus, it will be well to choose those who aspire to journey the true way with great care and discretion. Never overlook the sacrifices that you may be called upon to make. These are words spoken by Asira. MAN 3317 In the book of the Bearers of Light is written, Asira says to those about him, I am the first among light bearers. I am the one instructed by the great God. 
I am the one with knowledge concerning the building of the first shrine of mysteries. I alone of those now upon earth hold the key to the sacred mysteries. I know the secret of things that are past, of things that are, and of things that are to be. The act of birth enwraps the soul of man in a mantle of unconsciousness. It imprisons the spirit in the state of slumber. His own true self is within him, but it is as one dead within a tomb. All the great spiritual powers lie latent, locked inside. Even though the mortal abode be formed to perfection, the true way is the road to freedom. It is the process of awakening the spirit and the key to spiritual self-awareness. It unlocks the door and reveals the light. It banishes all doubts and grants an assurance of life everlasting. It is man discovering himself. Such is the true way. M.A.N. 3318 God says to Asira, Behold, the land before you, it is a chosen land for safeguarding the sacred mysteries. Out of its womb shall come the child of truth, which shall die and rise again to lead men in the struggle to glory. In the day of his rising, the earth will be distressed, and know it not, nor will it open its arms to the child, which will go unrecognized and even be despised and mocked. Yet in that day will be produced a salve to heal the scars of mankind. In that day, when men shall have forgotten the way of righteousness and turned from truth, the light will come unto them. These words were spoken by God. M.A.N. 3319 When Asira came to Egypt, the people were unlearned and wild. And they lived in huts and holes, seeking their food in the wilderness about them. He gathered them together and gave laws to guide them. He taught the growing and gathering of corn, the making of the waterways and channels, the building of habitations for the living and the dead. The gods of the people were dangerous gods to be feared, to be approached fearfully by none but those who were familiar with their ways. Those alone could interpret the signs and portents rarely granted in those days. Asira did not deny the people these gods, but he changed men as time changes trees. Even so, has Asira changed in the hearts of men, and he is as they have made him. M.A.N. 3320 Before the coming of Asira, men and women dwelt apart, men going into women of their choice, but the women kept to the fires while men roamed about, though in those days they never defiled the land of another with their feet. Asira drew them together and taught them the laws of marriage, but still he let men and women dwell apart if they so willed, though now no man lay with a woman, not his wife. M.A.N. 3321 Asira taught the making of bread with gathered corn and sown corn. It was eaten at the floodwater feast with salt and with honey. For Asira knew the nature of salt, which is of the bodies of men, and the nature of honey, which is of heaven. Salt is found in bitter waters, which wash far off shores in the land of the salt mountains. Men who have sailed far have seen great mountains covered with salt, and they lie under the steadfast stars, gleaming in a strange light. Honey comes airborne from heaven to be gathered by the bee. Once the earth was veiled within an awesome cloud, and in those days honey fell as frost upon the ground, and it fed men and beasts when the herbage withered. M.A.N. 3322 when Asira had drawn the people together, so that they dwelt peacefully in the land, they inquired of him whether he knew the likeness of their gods, whom none among them had ever seen. Therefore he fashioned the likenesses of the gods for them. He built cities wherein to keep them, and cultivated the land. He caused temples to be set up, and 
In these were placed the likenesses of the gods, which Osiris equipped. The likenesses he made satisfied the people, so that their hearts were made glad. Then the gods entered into their bodies of wood and stone. M.A.N. 3323 Yet Osiris was sad. His heart was heavy for the people. He knew their nature and the ignorance of their ways. Therefore, he assigned a protector to be the guardian of the people, one who knew truth, who was an enlightened one, who was greatest among the twice-born, one to be an ever-open channel to God, so that a flood of spiritual power should inundate the land, spreading bounty and peace over its expanse. He assigned to him all the people in the land, that they may prosper. Asira placed the land in the hands of the appointed one, with all the water within its bounds, all the herbage, the cattle of the pasture lands, and beasts of the wild places, and all things that fly and crawl. M.A.N. 3324 This appointed one was the king, the pharaoh, the light of God on earth, the vice-regent of God over men, him, Osiris endowed with the essence of the spirit outflowing from God, the power that reaches towards divinity. He was the link, the bridge between God and man. His was the task to bring men, the knowledge and awareness of divinity, and to preserve the special spirituality with which he was endowed in a select portion of one race. By his authority alone, all places of worship should be built and kept and their ceremonies controlled and performed. By his decree alone, all canals should be cut, all waterways opened, all lands marked out, and all war hosts raised. Under him, all food should be gathered and stored, all men fed, and every burial permitted and performed. He would be the supreme channel of contact with God. He and all who came from out of his loins should be ladders of light. Asira, it was who himself ordained that as their bodies were filled with vitalized spirit essence, they should be preserved to keep such power bound to earth for its good. M.A.N. 3325 Such was Pharaoh, a god below gods, a man above men. He was bound by the decrees of olden times and must ever set truth over falsehood. He was the narrow channel between God and man, one whose task was to reveal God to men. The family of Pharaoh was, in the first place, chosen by the Council of Light. In those days, a few families were selected, and some chosen from them to be carefully bred, so that all the less desirable traits were excluded. Their aim and objective was to produce men and women perfect in goodness, the ultimate in perfection. These were the qualities in which they were trained to the highest degree in duty and responsibility, obligation towards the people in dignity, justice, and benevolence. They were a family, a race apart, trained wholly to governing goodness. Every moment of their lives was to be devoted and dedicated to the elevation of mankind. They were taught to regard the people as their own children to be guarded, guided, and inspired by the finest examples possible. The family of Pharaoh was to reach out to the very summit of aspiration, to aim for the pinnacle of goodness and spirituality. While the common people labored under them, the whole life of royal families was to be devoted to service and goodness, to the elevation of mankind, to the preservation and administration of justice. M.A.N. 3326 Originally, this worked perfectly. But earthly conditions are finally balanced between the call of the divine and the demons of the flesh. Somewhere down through the ages, the dam of spirituality sprang a leak, and that which had hitherto been hoarded and guarded ebbed away. The divinity, the spirituality, and the blood was diluted. It became weakened, and when goodness diminished, its opposite crept in. What has this glorious institution of the great pharaoh become today? He is no more than the clacking tongue of a bell, a hollow empty shell, a vein in the wind. He is not the owner of his own time. His days belong to others, and the hours of his nights are controlled. 
He follows a shallow, feudal ceremonial. He performs empty, meaningless rituals. He eats according to instructions and bathes at the rising and setting of the sun. Not for his own pleasure, but because he must. Where is the glory in this? Oh, for what once was. Oh, for the joyful days of the past. What has happened to the glorious spiritual inspiration? Where once there was a purpose, now there is foolishness. Where once there was a sacred being, now there is a puppet manipulated by puppets. Where once there was a divine insight, now there are dead precedents. All is gone. All is dust. All is woe. M.A.N. 3327 Now, this Osira, of whom I speak, is even he whom the people of this land have made a god. For the twice-born who have wisdom have let it be thus. Call him man or call him god. It is a matter of small importance, for the boundary between them is not impassable. Petty men will argue about the distinctions of words, but they would be better engaged in discovering truth. The Syrah was ever enshrined in the hearts of the common folk, who had believed in immortality from the beginning. It was not so much their ignorance that obscured the light of truth, but rather the structure erected by hypocrisy and pomp, by avarice and ambition. Down through the ages, this belief in immortality persisted over the official view, which held that no more than a few might hope for immortality, and that mainly ensuing from the efforts of others. In the days of the first pharaohs, it was different. Then immortality was the reward of all people, though only collectively, and under the leadership and guidance of the king. Nevertheless, the immortality of the common folk and the immortality of the twice-born were not alike. M.A.N. 3328 Osiris came not into a land of powerful kings and great cities, but into a land of ignorant, unenlightened men. He came with seven strangers from a land far east of the Sea of Death, a land not as old as Egypt, but long since dead and forgotten. When Osiris came, he found two peoples of power on the river, the people of Ro and the people of Haru, and Haru was of the body of Atim. There had long been war between these two peoples, but Osiris pacified them and united them as one, and then he taught them the ways of peace and the ways of prosperity. M.A.N. 3329 When men began to build places to dwell in and to grow things, they were troubled by men who came out of the wilderness. These were a people ruled by women, and though the men were small in stature, the women who ruled were tall and lean. Their only weapons were such as could be thrown from afar. But they had shields made of hide woven in a manner which caused anything coming against them to become entangled. Such were the men who came out of the wilderness and the wild places there. Strong men and hairy. M.A.N. 3330 The queen of these people was not as the other women, for she was good to look upon. Besides being a great huntress, she was fairer than the other women, even more fair than the woman of Egypt, who put all others to shame. Her name was Neth, and I know of no man who has knowledge of her father. Perhaps she was an undying one, who was always there, though I cannot believe there are any such beings. Yet even in these days there is a race of men beyond the mountains, whose span of life is thrice that of other men. M.A.N. 3331 I need not describe the manner in which Osiris went out to meet Neth, and how his bow, the first bow seen in the land of Egypt, won her in contest. This can be learned from the tales told to the people which all contain within them a core of truth. I will not indulge in the recounting of such tales. They can be found in other places. The bow Osiris gave Neth as a pledge is the same as that one upon which men still make oath and pledge their word. M.A.N. 3332 Osiris did not at once take Neth to wife, and this is little understood. 
but it was a thing that could not be done in those days. At first, she was adopted by him as his sister, according to the custom. Later, men called her Asita, she being the same whom men call Asitas in these days. This is a name of the same meaning, for in the tongue of the old river people, the name became Ness. Later, this was changed to Neset, which in the old tongue meant she who was Ness. Then it was ordained that Asira should marry his sister, and Asidus gave birth to the man-child Hori. He is the same after whom the kings of Egypt, even in these days, take their title, for he was the first true pharaoh, though others may disagree. M-A-N 3333 Men lacking understanding will say, I write about mortals and not gods. And this is true as it is false. The truth is that there are no fixed regions of gods, spirits, and mortals, separate one from the other. Neither are all these entirely separate and different forms of beings. There is no impenetrable boundary between mortals, spirits, and gods. Neither is it to be understood that mortals reach the status of gods entirely by their own efforts. Gods are chosen by the people and raised to godhood by the people for the benefit of the people. If they choose wisely, they are blessed. But if they choose unwisely, then whatever befalls is upon their own heads. As the people conceive their gods, so will they be. This is something hardly understood in these days. The worship of such gods is, of itself, neither right nor wrong, for this depends entirely upon its effects and objective. If it serves the purpose of good, if it is to the spiritual benefit of man, it guides in the right direction. If it does not, or if it be sterile or purposeless, then it is at best a misleading phantom. In its worst aspect, it is an instrument of evil. When a man ceases to believe in his God, the fault is not wholly with either. Each is at fault. Each has equally failed the other. The man no longer serves the God as the God no longer serves the man. Neither gains and both lose. A man without a god is neither a free man nor a whole being. His life is incomplete. He lacks something vital to his existence. When, from some cause, a god loses worshippers, he is no longer wholly a god. He becomes a god without ties, a wild god or wandering spirit, retaining some of his powers, but none of his rank. Such, then, is the nature of gods, who are but beings originating as mortals, further advanced along the road towards godhood than other mortals who chose them as representatives and leaders in the heavenly sphere. If you would live with truth, never confuse gods with God, for gods are but a step upward on the stairway from man to God. M-A-N 3334 There is still one true temple of Asidus, but it is unknown to men in these days. Though many others hypocritically declare their allegiance, the true temple itself is hidden behind a false facade for protection. It is still dedicated to the ennoblement of men. It still upholds the virginity of its maidens and dedicates them to modesty and innocence. It is still a bright light in the gathering darkness. It still maintains the flame of spirituality, which in days to come will light the fire which consumes evil and purges men of wickedness. In these days, the priesthood is corrupt, and temples are places of evil, where wickednesses are made more wicked by being condoned in the name of sanctity. M-A-N 3335 Asetis left her people, and Setis, her brother, ruled the people of the Sand Barons. Later gaining power over many of the people of the river, he was one who was great among men. He led them in the ways of men the easy ways, along the wide road, beloved by the multitude, and followed so unthinkingly. There is no point in retelling here the accounts of the deeds of Asira and Setis, nor of how Asira was betrayed by his blood brother from whom he did not expect treachery, and slain at Nadet in Tawara. This was after he and those with him had been lured there and enclosed in battle. Though there had been much shedding of blood, Asira still believed the best of men, but he was deceived. His body was dismembered and scattered, 
so that none should worship at his shrine. But this only spread goodness throughout the land. When his body was united, his spirit rose in greatness above all spirits. Sadis was later slain by Hori, and now awakes men in the dawn halls, where he bids them sit patiently, passive, and at rest. Hori, too, awaits men there, but he says, Arise, O glorious one, move and be active, for you are reborn. M.A.N. 3336 Hori was the staff of his father, but he could not bring the people to walk in the way of light. Therefore, the light was withdrawn from them. He ever exhorted the people to change their ways, but they stopped their ears to his voice. His words were launched vainly on air. In the book of The Bearers of Light, it is written of his efforts. Hori brought lasting peace to the lands of water and sand, and to their peoples he gave long life and prosperity. The bounty of the waters was theirs, but still they gave no heed to his words of enlightenment. They declined the call to spiritual austerity and discipline. Thus it came about that he brought before him the council of twenty-four, and said, Go, speed on your way, send men through the length of the land, even unto the three peoples, and warn them, lest they bring the wrath of the great God, he who is the eye of the dawning day, down upon their heads. Say unto them, Forsake the paths of evil, Turn aside from the byways of wickedness and cast down the shrines of false gods who have misled you. Let their names be utterly obliterated from your hearts and cut out from the places where they are engraved. If you stop your ears to my words, so these things be not done, then the wrath of the great God shall surely come down upon you and do punishment meted out by the waters." M.A.N. 3337. Thus spoke Hori. But his words were as good seed falling upon unwatered ground. Instead of plants, all manner of weeds sprang up to smother the tender shoots of the good seed, even before they rose up into the sunlight. Then he cried out to the enlightening God, O oh, great God, I have failed miserably in my task, and the people still walk perversely in the ways of wickedness. Their feet incline away from truth. Men have taken to every manner of wrongdoing, and their lusts go unrestrained. The cities are steeped in inequity. There are places where men practice every kind of abomination. Instead of the abode of glory, the bodies of men have become a lurking place for every kind of evil. Oh my God, where have I failed? What can I say to you? What can I do? Grant me an ear of understanding, O God. M.A.N. 3338 The Spirit of God responded to the cry of Hori in this manner. My son, take not unto yourself the blame for the inequity of these perverse people. Leave them to steep in the brew of their wickedness, which they have prepared for themselves. For there is a point beyond which my administrators are not required to go. Leave the wicked, and gather the select few unto yourself, for thus it shall ever be. Many will cry at the gates, but few shall enter. Abandon the misled to their false shrines, for the day will dawn when all these shall be dust borne away on the wind. Even then the words of truth shall remain unto men. Go, cherish the few, and abandon the many." Hide the sacred mysteries in places where they shall be least sought. Choose well those who are of one thought with you. A roof is better supported upon a few sound pillars than on many unstable ones. Yet the day is not far distant when many shall give ear to the words of wisdom, for if their ears are stopped, they are lost. Those from whom you incline your head shall be removed from out of your sight, and they shall become lost in restless spirits. To you is given command of men, as he who fathered you is given command of spirits. M.A.N. 3339 All things that God commanded, or he did, 
and when at last he lay in the arms of the great bride, he knew that the foundation for the temple of truth was well and truly laid. In the book of the bearers of light is the supplication of Hori. M.A.N. 3340 O oh, ageless God of aging things, O oh, constant one, amid inconsistency, no mere words of mine can hope to make known the gratitude welling up as an everlasting spring within my heart. In the midst of my desolation, you brought me comfort. Into the darkness of my spirit, you came as a comforting light. You led me forth when the wilderness shut me and guided my feet when they became entangled in the chaos of waters. When my enemies descended upon the people to devour them, you scattered the foe like frightened asses, fleeing before a lion. You have magnified me in the eyes of the faithful. I am made great, even among the chosen. My people, you have made your people. M.A.N. 3341 You have favored us among all others, and have granted us a knowledge of your laws that our way may not be undirected. You have taught us the performance of your statutes, that we might conform to your will. You have revealed to us the boundaries between light and darkness, between wisdom and ignorance, between the spirit and the mortal, between the sacred and the profane. You have set the faithful apart from all other people and revealed unto us our duties and obligations. M.A.N. 3342 O oh, our God, grant that the days allotted to us be days of peace and plenty. Show us yet more clearly the path of purity, that we fall not into the abyss of inequity and the veil of temptation. Let us not stray from the path of righteousness, and in the wilderness of wickedness let us not become lost. M.A.N. 3343 Favor us with wisdom and skill. For if there be anything holy of earth within the grasp of man that is truly desirable, is it not skill and knowledge? Of all things outside of heaven, these are most praiseworthy. Though these be not of the Spirit, grant them to us, O oh God, for you are the fount of all knowledge. M.A.N. 3344 When we stray, as oft men do, let not the force that brings us back onto the path afflict us too much. We acknowledge our weaknesses with humility and our failings with repentance. When we wander, bring us back into the light of your laws, that we may not be swallowed up in the darkness of ignorance. M.A.N. 3345 Forgive us our deeds of wickedness, pardon our transgressions, grant us reprieve from the effects of our wrongdoing. Give us whatever this may entail, that which will benefit us the most spiritually. Teach us, O God, to accept with resignation the wondrous workings of your will. Everlasting glory is with you, sanctity is yours. Therefore, we honor you with submission and service. We, your servants, acknowledge our obligations. We, your children, declare our love and loyalty. M.A.N. 3346 Hori died after the manner known and was buried in glory. There is no recounting of his deeds. Then there was peace throughout all the lands. Beside the Nile and contentment reigned everywhere. Many great kings lived and ruled and gradually the light of truth was again revealed unto men. It never fails to appear when men are deserving is this not sufficient indication of the forbearance of God?